I'll be the first one. Yeah. And if they're up. Yeah.
Thank you for the great introduction. So um, welcome, welcome back to uh, day two. It's glad to see everybody came back and congratulate our colleague from Morocco. <laughs> A great win last night. Excellent. So I wanted to start today with just a quick um, overview or description. You all received our six cycle workbook. Um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what's in here. The, the first part of the workbook really focuses on surveillance. And it's, it's a really high level overview because if you look back through all the other training cycle workbooks, we spent a lot of time working on surveillance, describing surveillance. And so this is just more of a high level overview. Um, but the second half of the, of the workbook is what this workshop has been largely focused on. And it's something we haven't written up or made a workbook before, and that's actually disease management. And I think that's uh, the next step when you think about surveillance. It's information for action, right? It's, it, it's intended to be used to help, help us control some wildlife diseases or improve wildlife health at some level. And so this isn't going to be, you, sh you should do X, Y, Z. This, the description in here is more to think about things, questions you might want to answer, uh, situations that might come up when you're trying to implement disease management. And, and the reason why we did it this way is because every country is different. We can't give you a prescription or um, a recipe to do your disease management in your country. So this is just a, to hopefully be a, help, a helpful guide to think about things that others have experienced when trying to manage diseases in different systems. So that's, I just wanted to give you a brief description because we really didn't talk about the workbook yesterday, but that's what, what this is intended, how this is intended to be used. And in the back, there's also references and stuff. Um, I know a colleague from Uganda, or maybe it's Congo, was interested in, in uh, carcass disposal. And so there's some references and stuff in there as well. So it, hopefully it'll be a good resource um, for you moving forward. So today is going to be a little bit different. We're going to start out it's, it's morning, get people engaged. So this is going to be more a little bit more of a discussion than it is going to be a lecture style. Um, and so I wanted to pose a question. There's a wealth of knowledge um, in this room. People have, and we saw it yesterday in our discussions, particularly around anthrax. There's been a lot of work done by different people in this room on different wildlife health issues. And so we're hoping that we can have some discussions around that today for this first half hour to help us learn from each other. And so, so the question um, that uh, um, I, I'm going to pose to you is, is that I'm going to take five minutes to, to think about a wildlife disease that you've tried to manage in your country or you know enough about. You, you know, you've worked with other people that are trying to manage this disease. And then answer these questions, or this question, what do you think are the biggest social and ecological challenges for preventing introduction of that disease, if that's your goal, or controlling the disease if it's already in your country. So, so I'm gonna just set an example here. So for, for me, I work a lot with chronic wasting disease in North America. And so an example of some of the ecological challenges that, that I face with this disease is I have difficulty measuring the indirect transmission component. So this is a prion disease and in infectious protein. And we don't have good ways of measuring that in the, environment, in the environment, but we know it's important for disease transmission. So that's an ecological challenge that, that, that I face. Um, I don't have good information on contract rates between the different host species. And so that's challenging when I'm trying to model the disease. Um, it's a, it, it infects a generalist species. They're wide ranging. Um, there's lots of them. And, and then when we apply management, oftentimes there's lag effects. So I try to reduce densities, but it may take years in order to actually start to see those effects. And so these are all ecological challenges that I, that I face when trying to manage uh, the, the disease. But maybe more importantly, at least in, in my system, are the social challenges. And what I mean by that, those could be, the, could be political, it could be working with stakeholders, different pieces of members of the public. Um, because, for example, when we try to apply management, let's say density, density reduction of the host species, it's highly unpopular. People don't like it. In fact, oftentimes it gets very political and the legislature steps in and tells the agency, you can't do that. And so that's a huge social challenge when we're trying to manage this disease. Um, also, the public has become desensitized. They don't care anymore. They will eat the infected animal even if we tell them not to. And we heard some of that yesterday with the hippos and, you know, and the anthrax. Um, and, and largely, for us to be successful, we're re realizing more and more that we're, we need to affect human behavior. We need them to be working with us. And oftentimes, if they're opposed to that, it's very difficult. So the purpose of, the, of this exercise is to, just to have you think about one of the major diseases that you're working with 
and think about what are the challenges both on ecology, but also just as important on the social or political or economic side. So let's take five minutes to just write down or, or think about a disease in your country that you can answer these questions for. And then we'll come back and we'll just discuss it as a group. Does that, does that make sense? Do you understand what we're asking? If not, you can raise your hand and I can come, come, come speak with you. Voilà, donc on prend cinq minutes euh, maintenant à comment gérer les maladies euh, dans chacun de vous dans son pays. Euh, ici, euh, nous avons parlé du charbon bactéridien ou si vous avez d'autres maladies infectieuses euh, chez vous, si la gestion pose problème, je crois que c'est juste pour se partager des expériences. Merci. Vous voulez intervenir
All right, maybe one more minute. So the next 15 minutes or so, um, let's just hear, hear some folks' answers. Anybody feel, feel comfortable in uh, talking to the group about the disease, the disease that, they're, that they're trying to manage and the ecological and, and sociological challenges that, that they're facing in managing it? We have a, volunteers, a volunteer to start with. Who will be brave? Ah, excellent. From Zambia. Uh, yes, maybe I'll talk of the management of anthrax in the Luango ecosystem, so as to adapt to what was discussed yesterday in Malawi because they are neighbors. Yeah. Yes, so um, the biggest challenge that we face is that one, Anthrax in the Luango ecosystem is like it's endemic, so there's the issue of endemicity. So literally, as it is established itself, and also you know it's affecting a number of species. So you have it in hippos, you have it in buffaloes. At times, like last year, we had elephants affected, and then it even went on because of the decomposing carcasses. Some predators ate that. So we found that. The, when you see it and do your analysis, whether it's affecting literally a lot of species. The other challenge is that you see it's late detection because the park is quite vast. Some areas are very hard to reach. So by the time you receive a report that no, they've seen a hippocacus maybe like today. But when you go back to do your investigations and the, you find that Literally, you come to discover that maybe the first case could have been some two, three weeks back. So by that, then the dynamics of spread on the ground also have, they have changed. Yeah. And uh, to us, it normally occurs at the beginning or at the onset of the rain, at the beginning of the rain season. Okay. So you find that uh, when you start, you'll have a lot of cases. But I think uh, as the rains increase, the water levels rises in the Luangwa River, then there is some effect of dilution rate, I think. So you tend to get carried away to say that, well, maybe the measures we put in place have been enough to contain the disease, but yet it's just that dilution rate of the spores. Yeah. Then uh, the social challenges. In Zambia, we eat a lot of game meat. So for you to tell the people that and the buffalo meat or hippo meat is a delicacy, to tell people to say that, well, don't eat this meat because we suspect that there is this, is quite a very big challenge. Yeah. Some will tell you that we have lived with diseases for the rest of our lives and we are still alive. So <laughs> you have to, and then the other part that you see, if you talk of buffalo and hippo, to our hunting, our official hunters, these hunting safaris, that brings it a lot of revenue to both the communities and the, the government. So now, when you have a situation like that, you tend to now say, well, I think because of the problem which we have in the Luango Valley, we are discouraging hunting because the probability of cross infections are very high. So you know, you tend to meet a lot of resistance to that. Others will tell you that, no, we got these permits from a government institution, we have to hunt and we are going to go with them. So I think it's, it, it, it demands 
diprong approaches it demands a lot of networking and you have to go through these meetings so those are some of the challenges we've seen with the anthrax in the luangwa ecosystem in zambia that's that that's excellent i really appreciate you being to point out both the ecology and sociology sites i think that's something we we think about maybe we don't necessarily connect to the management as much as we should but i mean i think those are common problems multi-host systems environmental reservoirs lack of detection and then hunters expecting a resource mm -hmm. and, the, and the indigenous people mm -hmm. partaking of it so these th those are some great examples of some of the social and ecological challenges that that we face probably on a daily basis um, in trying to manage these diseases we have another example yes all right thank you very much um Amai is not about a disease that we particularly encountered because in Gambia we are, um, like for example, when the, there was an outbreak of avian influenza in Senegal, and we tried to, because we have an avian influenza plan that we developed, that we, we have, it is in two phases that when the disease occurs in the country, what we should do, and when it is in the neighboring country, what we should do. So one of the challenges, the the migratory species of birds that are coming in because they don't have any borders. And yesterday you guys were talking about some <clears throat> management strategies that, we, we, that are supposed to be implemented for the management of certain diseases, but I didn't hear you talk about the birds because they are important and, and they are always moving from one part of the, the continent to another. And some of those areas are prone to HPAI and those birds are coming right to the Gambia and they have some roosting sites and some pass through Senegal and, and other country. So I was thinking what exactly can be done to, to minimize the, the, the birds bringing in some of these, um, the, the HPAI. Because I remembered um, the last time I was in the US, we have seen a lot of, that was just in, in, in August. We have seen a lot of vultures die of suspected avian influenza and some of them are migrating. And then some of them will end up landing in, in other countries that do not have HPAI, and there is um, and a possibility of these birds um, having some of these diseases. And vultures do eat each other. Like when a vulture dies, um, another vulture will scavenge on that vulture, and there, there is this <laughs> spread of the disease. So I was like thinking, what can be done to, to minimize? And we cannot call the, the the population of the vultures or the population of the birds that are infected. Most of them come with the disease and it is actually difficult. And some of the, the social economic um, part of it that has become challenging during the implementation was the talking to the, to the public about, about the, the HPAI. And now the farmers were like, so if, if in the event we have an outbreak and you're supposed to call all of my birds and at the end of the day, who is going to compensate me? They're like, they need compensation for a poultry farmer or uh, owner of a poultry that has a huge amount of money invested in a poultry. And then they said they need compensation or else nobody will touch their, their poultry when there is an outbreak. So we are trying to think around that, how we're gonna like deal with those people that are like being so much aggressive on our, some of our strategies to be able to minimize the, the, the HPAI in case there is an outbreak. So those are some of the things we, we're trying to, to look at for the meantime. So if there is anything you have, we can share. Yes, th th thank you. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, migratory species are, are very challenging, right? And, and I would say another kind of social or challenge that, that we have, and I think it sounds like you have too, is that it, because it's crossing borders, you really have to work with your other countries or states or provinces in our case. And so it, it gets really challenging and it, and it really, you're asking like how, I mean, we're, we're challenged with HPAI too. We don't have a magic solution on how to, how to deal with it. Um, we try to minimize contacts, you know, cross boundary, transboundary contacts that way, but with wild, wild species, it's, it's really difficult. And particularly as they come in, you know, we have, we're coming from both Europe and Asia and North America. Um, and so, by the time, like you said, by the time they get to, to us, they have, they, they, they've been exposed along the, the travel routes. Um, and it's been a challenge for us as well with the compensation. It 
Okay, particularly in, right now, we've gone this last year. We've gone through a lot of die-offs. It's been very expensive to try and compensate these farmers. Um, so, not sure we have any solutions. But those are. I, I think this is this is this is a good discussion because it really highlights how how complex this is and, and how the management is dependent on, in this case, farmers and poultry producers being willing to participate in the activities that you're, you're trying to promote to protect their flocks because they're fearing the economic loss. Um, so. Uh, no solutions for you, unfortunately. <laughs> we, could, we could talk more, but um, it, it's a really good example of how, how complex this can be on both the ecological side, but also on the sociological side. So thanks for sharing. Others? Yes, Zimbabwe. OK, thank you. Um, well, my story is on, um, on rabies. It's a big thing um, in the sense that, um, you know, once it gets into a dog population, then it, 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 it spreads like, like third fire. But what also, when, when you get cases in the wild, it's, it's a lot of multiple species that are affected. So you probably get jackals, you, you, know, you get tourists calling you and say, look, we, we have a jackal here. Um, no, it's dead, we, you know, or it's acting funny. Then you probably get painted dogs, and because of their conservation status, it's also worrying. Then it spills over because once the, those animals die, they're, they're predated on by other animals. So you get animals like, um, you know, last time we got a honey badger, actually three honey badgers. We had um, five painted dogs. We had uh, three jackals. Then we also had a lion and a hyena as well. So, you know, and would collect those samples. And the problem is because it's, it's, it's a big area. The density is, well, I mean, it's very spaced and diverse. You, you probably get a case today. You get a case maybe next month. You get another case. And they come in very varying, um, well, in varying conditions in terms of specimen quality. But eventually, yeah, you know, some you probably will be able to test and get, you know, a, a confirmative diagnosis. But with some, it's, it's, it's probably difficult. But then, you know, even if you try and have a multi-stakeholder approach, these cases are happening in between. I mean, it's a very long time. But before you realize it's six months and you probably have 20 cases. <laughs> and and you, you, you don't even know when to sit and say, look, guys, look, we have a big problem. Because <laughs> probably it's already too late. But nevertheless, what we have as a country or have decided to do is we, we looked at what we can do in the confines of that. Because... <sighs> These animals always operate at interface area, and people keep dogs. I mean, keep dogs for various reasons, security, you know, and, um, and the population of dogs is huge. So what we have decided and what we always do is we say we have annual rabies campaigns. At certain periods of the year, it's mandatory. We, in our country, rabies is actually part of a regulation where, you, you know, you keep a dog, you are mandated to have it vaccinated for rabies. So we have campaigns where we say, look, um, you know, you bring a dog to a centralized position or centralized point, then they're vaccinated for like a dollar, so cost recovery, so it's a dollar, you have to, you know, do that. Then we have organizations who say, look, we can do that, we can mobilize resources around the interface area. So what we're saying is we're probably trying to use dogs as buffer, so that these dogs, you know, once they get infected, they don't get to, um, you know, affect especially children under the age of 18 we get a lot of cases where people just report that my dog you know my daughter or my son has been bitten by a dog but the dog just went to war and you know we couldn't find it and most you know um the sorry part is these animals then you know because you you are not able to get that um specimen and because of the cost of getting that child or you know person vaccine uh, you know anti-rabies it's people then tend to assume that, well, maybe let's treat it as a dog by wound because the cost is also huge. Then eventually when the signs start coming out, it's actually a very, you know, sorry state. So it's, 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 it's very complex in how we, you know. But what I also want to point out to say, look, it's, it's not really about responsible pet ownership. We have a large stray dog population. You know, literally not that because they don't belong to anyone, but people are not really responsible owners. So when you say, look, we have a campaign, they don't bring those dogs. And those dogs are the problem. They, they sort of like keep that virus within, you know, so it sort of like becomes dog mated, mediated rabies. Then it passed, it's passed on either from humans or either to humans or back to the wildlife species. And, you know, 
So it's, it's something then we, we're trying to, um, to look and say, look, how can we manage this? We have tried tie-up campaigns, but you see, they, you know, in this light where there is a lot of animal welfare uh, concerns, it's very difficult to destroy a dog. I mean, it's, you know, everyone is watching and, you know, so it's, it's, it's a problem, but we, we're trying to, to see of how best we can try and manage, because rabies, it's, it's, it's actually even worse when you see someone lying there with signs and you cannot do anything about it. And now we think back and say, look, we could have vaccinated the dog. If, you know, it's only a dollar, but we didn't. So that's, that's probably our story. But um, yeah, going forward, it's, it's, always, it's always a cause of concern. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's a yeah, I mean, somewhat moving story when you think about the human aspects of this, both in terms of you know, the pet ownership, but also the, the effects of disease on people itself. Um, that, that kind of transboundary border between domestic animals and then you have feral, which is somewhere in between wild and, and, uh, and domestic animals that no one's necessarily responsible for. Yeah. Um, that becomes really challenging. And we deal with some of those with like feral swine where no agency takes responsibility, but they're a huge factor <coughs> for lots of different diseases. And, and how do you handle that? Um, and there's a whole social component to this too. So I think these are some really great examples. I think we're about a, out of time here, but the, the intent of this exercise was just to get us thinking and set us up for some table talk type exercise to, tomorrow, but also Dr. Leanne's talk today, where we really start to think about um, these, these social and ecological um, pieces and parts of how we're trying to manage wildlife disease from a systematic or holistic perspective to help us to hopefully identify the places in the system where we can most be most effective, um, both in term of, terms of efficiency, but also efficacy of trying to manage disease while also protecting the, the human aspects of this or domestic animal aspects of it. So thank you so much for, for the time. This is kind of just an introduction see, uh, to get people talking and thinking. So thank you. Merci, Dr. Daniel. Votre temps de l'intervention a pris fin. Et nous allons inviter le Dr. Joan de l'Université de Pretoria à venir présenter euh, les causes profondes et facteurs de propagation de maladies, euh, la télé rouge et l'antilope associées avec la translocation. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I'd like to thank the, the OIE for inviting me to come and address such a, such a, such a wide audience in Africa. I'm going to be talking about a disease component. It is not really, I suppose, in the light of what we've been discussing the last day or so, not one of the major things that always comes up, but I think there's important lessons to learn, and uh, hopefully we can apply it on, on the more important uh, conditions as well. So I've had a very intimate relationship with these disease in antelope species in South Africa, and essentially because of our farming type of uh, enterprises that we've got there, um, this was um, necessary to come up with some novel ideas of how to, how to control this condition. Uh, I think we can apply this to a wide range of um, filaria associated conditions in uh, throughout Africa as well. But before I start Morocco, I was really impressed with how you guys played last night. Uh, considering that at least one of your players is statistically is suffering from echinococcosis. You know. So, uh, <laughs> really, really impressed by that, you know. So, anyway, so can I just have a, maybe a pointer? Do we have a pointer? That we can... <laughs> okay. okay, right, there we go. All right, so just a bit of background uh, from my side. So I'm a veterinary pathologist. Yesterday excited me quite a lot because we were talking about death, um, anything killing things. So, you know, that is what excites me is, you know, if, this, if, if something doesn't kill you, then I'm not really interested. So um, I do a lot of uh, uh, training, undergraduate, postgraduate training in pathology, a lot of diagnostics in South Africa as well. And part of uh, one of my main research focus areas was thaliriosis in uh, the Petrogenae family of, of antelope species, uh, which uh, really opened our minds to, to this uh, condition to be applied also elsewhere in thaliriosis, as I said previously. So I'm currently the head of the section there. 
and aquatics is also a quite a big interest of mine. But let's start with a bit of background on tyleriosis specifically. So there's not a lot of literature available, although this condition is universal. It is ubiquitous throughout South Africa, or not just South Africa, Africa in general. Um, we've got the condition of thyroid versus cytoxoan and the differences between them. With molecular technology, we have now basically separated thyloria as, as a disease condition that really affects the ruminant population at large, and cytoxoan is something with, that, that is similar in, in um, uh, uh, molecular relatedness, but it's certainly more common in our uh, wild field species. Okay. So, uh, thyloria, as I said, multiple species gets infected with it, um, we need to differentiate between clinical carrier disease and a, or clinical disease and carrier state. If you go out there today and you um, have an antelope and you make a blood smear of that antelope, you are going to see a thyleria parasite. So that's a carrier animal. They all carry it, they're getting bitten, they're getting infected. And that's important to know what do you do with that. When you make the blood smear, and you look at it, you cannot tell what species it is. So you don't know what significance it has as well. Uh, in the past, people tried to morphologically differentiate between them, but it's not really possible. Today, we use molecular techniques to differentiate between them. If we look at the antelope species, so clinical disease has been reported largely in roan and sable antelope. So they are the two most susceptible species to clinical disease. Many of the other species are um, species that really gets affected just when density of the population increases. You're going to get thyleriosis being the terminal cause of death in some of them. But the and sable antelope can be, in fact, the primary pathogen. So uh, because we've got a farming enterprise in our country and the densities are very high on small properties, we can get a uh, species that's not really known to get uh, clinical disease also affected like this. And then we've had some importations like bison, fallow deer, and things into South Africa that has then also resulted in, in mortalities in those species. And that's, that stands to reason that it's quite obvious that you're going to expect that. So if we look at uh, Africa, I inserted this map last night because I thought it would be important, alongside the phylogenetic tree of Thaleria, and see where the group of Thaleria is, is that I worry that we, that we have. And I mean, most of you will, re will be much more familiar, obviously, with Thaleria pava, Thaleria annulata, since it's affecting cattle. It affects livelihoods of people because it affects production in these animals. But um, if you think about the wide range of all these different Thalerias that's known at, at, at this stage, it's a mixture throughout Africa. And we really don't know what the extent of these things are throughout Africa. So the important thing about control of Thaleriosis in antelope and maybe, you know, uh, um, um, in our uh, um, cattle population, our, our small stock population, relates basically to them getting infected and relocated. These days, relocation of animals is such a, such a thing. But when I look at exportation, importation permits, and I'm looking at the veterinary um, prerequisites for e importation, they only worried about Thaleria pava. People only want a PCR negative test for Thaleria pava, no matter what species it is, which is silly, which means people are not thinking about the, the implications. But what about importation of a Thaleria species from there to here? And that's what happened when I got started working on this disease. We had roan antelope that was imported from Benin, okay, uh, to South Africa. Nobody worried about what those antelope was carrying. They all was just worried about, let's get the ticks off them, and that's it, you know. Don't worry about, if it's not, if it's Thaleria parva negative, we're also happy. But it was carrying a lot of other Thaleria. So what is it introducing now into South Africa, and vice versa? So I think that, that's going to probably leave a little bit of food, of food for thought. But yes, this is not something you're going to be worrying too much about, because it's a wild animal. So what? Wildlife will sort it out, Mother Nature will sort it out. And sometimes that is what happens. But be careful. Um, we are now dealing, and I'm involved with importations from zoos, um, from overseas. People have taken wild animals out of Africa, and bred them very successfully in European and American zoos. And now there's this big effort to repatriate some of these animals here. 
The nice thing about that is that we don't have to really worry about the disease in those countries because it doesn't really exist there. But we are bringing a very susceptible animal into Africa. And a lot of people have paid lots of big money just to find they didn't do their risk assessment homework about this condition. They come here to die. So I'm hoping to get involved with a very um, uh, important importation of bongo to, Ken to Kenya. Uh, and, and in, in which thaleria or thaleriosis has been reported to be the major killer of previous efforts. Okay, so that's just to re relate what you could see. So continuing with the background, I talked about this, the vector species, really wide vector species, important to note that the vector species are multi-host species with thaleria. Okay, and it's going to come out now, why do I say so? The devil is a bit in the details about this. Important to note also, so these are important facts that you need to understand about thaleriosis if you're going to understand or develop control programs. The transmission between the ticks is transstadial, not transovarial. And it's around this principle, as a student, I never, nobody really explained it to me. But as a student, this principle is the principle by which we essentially banished East Coast fever and corridor disease throughout the major cattle producing parts of South Africa, based on this fact. I'll explain to you later a bit why. Transplant central transmission between the, the, the dam, the mother and uh, the calf is very low, but it's something to, to, to take note of because it can happen without the vector being there. So what are the problems? We've got a relocation of carrier antelope internationally. We don't really care about them except if it's Thaleria parva. Is that a mistake? I think it's a big problem. It's something we need to look into. Um, normally, just to stay on that for one second, normally our geographical barriers in nature has been the barriers between these different species moving around. Those geographical barriers have disappeared with much more efficient transportation methods. Okay, so we've also got uh, limited, uh, limited control through, that's, that's what I just said, um, and in the potential, and we have limited knowledge about the treatment and diagnosis of this condition. But it's slightly improving, certainly. So, as I said, the devil is in the details about understanding the life cycle. So you just refresh your memory about this. So they tell you that you must never talk about religion, politics, or sex. I unfortunately will have to talk about sex today. Parasite sex. Okay? What happens in the tick itself. And that is what's creating the problem. Once the tick gets infected by drinking the, uh, the pyroplasm infected red blood cells, the parasites undergoes the genetic recombination in the GIT. Not a nice place to have sex in the gut of a tick, but that's how they prefer it anyway. Okay? So then after you get a slightly recombined baby, that genetically modifies that population um, and potentially increase the risk for pathogenicity. Okay, so that is how pathogenic Valeria species can be selected and actually born into a population of animals. And that's why we sit with that very elaborate phylogenetic tree as well. It's all about sex of parasites. And then importantly to note as well, no transovarial transmission which essentially means that if you can keep a tick population free from a host, from a source of infection, eventually those ticks will die and they will take those parasites that they are carrying with them to the grave. And that's what happened in South Africa with buffalo um, um, associated thaleriosis. We essentially kept areas free from buffalo or cattle that was carrying thaleria parva. And then what happened over about a period of 18 months, because we calculated that is more or less the time, li the lifespan of a tick that carry it, Hypercephus spiniculatus. Over that period of time, you keep it free. The tick populations, you know, it's, not, it's impossible to get rid of the ticks. You can't get rid of the ticks. So we just deprive them of a source of infection. After 18 months, the tick population are still there, but they are free from infection. And now it will take great veterinary care from there on to prevent the reinfection obviously to take place. So that is where we are at the moment with our state veterinary services, preventing buffalo that's infected, in preventing cattle that's infected to infect the tick population again. And that certainly opens 
you know, um, the production um, potential for cattle farming or cattle production in our country. Okay. So you can see the importance of that. So diagnostics, um, just to quickly, briefly run through that. Clinically, animal has got a fever, a blood smear, or fine needle aspirate of the lymph nodes is diagnostic. Where we are looking for thylarial schizons, I will show you a picture of that now. And also then a PCR, and we would use a reverse line blot technique to in fact uh, test for a whole host of different thylarial species. Just to remember again the difference between uh, um, finding the parasite, we know it's there, and, and, and whether the animal is clinically ill, that is important to differentiate. And we can only do that really by looking at the pathology of when the animal has died, or the blood smear to show a clinical infection. At post-mortem, the macroscopic lesions is, very, is, is not very specific, but the blood smear, spleen or liver impression smears are diagnostic. And this pathology would also be diagnostic, but again, it will not uh, tell you what species of thylaria is involved. So this is what you see on blood smear. You get these schizons uh, in mononuclear leukocytes. It was previously believed to be lymphocytes. We've written a paper about the fact that that is not so true. It's more complicated than that we get actually uh, mononuclear transformation of monocytes and lymphocytes both getting infected. And if you find this on a blood smear, that is your clinical diagnosis of disease. If you see pyroplasms, which I said you will see on any blood smear of any antelope that you make out there, it means nothing, absolutely nothing, okay? It's a carrier state, it's running in the wildlife population, nothing happens. Okay, then if we look at the epidemiology, uh, I think Leanne had uh, some slide ab about this. Um, so uh, this is uh, similar, where the parasite host vector and the environment in, in, this, in this case being the central role player, geography being the limiting issue, issue, intensification which increases the numbers of vectors, increases the numbers of hosts, which is increasing the risk of disease. And then host factors, as we know now, round antelope, for example, being um, most susceptible to disease. Um, I wanna, don't want to go into detail about that, but we can talk about that if people ask questions about that. And then the vector as well. Remember, no transoverial transmission, which is important because in the control part of this condition, that is a possible avenue to pursue. So if these things are out of sync, out of balance, you get disease. And in Africa, doing nothing um, letting Mother Nature take its course is probably the reason why we're not seeing much disease in the wildlife population. Everything is in an endemic, stable situation. In South Africa, where we've got private ownership of land, and you add the human factor in there, you're getting this whole system out of synchronization, and you get endemic instability, moving animals around regularly, you get disease. Okay. So talking about, um, this is now a, a, an example of how buffalo are bred disease free. So we've had projects in South Africa where buffalo were kept in bomas. They were detected, taking the vector equation, although the, the adults are carriers of the infection, um, these animals um, did not transmit um, it through placental route or through uh, ticks that coming from the mother to the calf. So these calves are essentially free from thylariosis. Then we wean, at weaning, we take these calves away, we test these calves. If they are negative on PCR, we assume them to be free from the disease of thylariosis, thylaria pava. Then they can go into an area which is free from thylaria pava, and now we can ranch with buffalo as well, um, free from the disease. The important bit is this calf, if he doesn't get exposed in the first three months of his life of infection, if you put him back into the system, where he gets exposed to Thaleria pava, the buffalo is going to get corridor disease. Okay, we've had a couple of situations where that happens. So it can happen that they actually get sick as well. Treatment, um, we know about bupavaquin. People are using bupavaquin quite a bit in Africa, in our cattle. Uh,
Right, so thank you. Let me continue. So if we look at treatment for this condition, it's really difficult in wildlife, as you know. So it's not really a treatment option for us in wildlife. Bupabaquin, the important thing about bupabaquin to remember is that it does not sterilize the infection. So you cannot come and say, right, um, the animal is PCR positive for the disease. Let me treat it uh, with bupabaquin and we're going to then get a negative result and we can import the animals or export the animals. The danger with that is if people are aware of this, you can suppress the level of parasitism in a window period with using bupavaquin. So I hope I'm not teaching you something to be naughty about, okay? So if you give them bupavaquin, you can suppress the level so the PCR is negative. Okay, so that reason, because we know people are naughty, bupavaquin is not legally able to use in South Africa. Okay, so we can't use it there. So know about that. We have... Um, uh, a number of control measures that can be taken um, into account. We can control the vectors by various uh, methods. It's also important to know that disease is dose dependent in these animals as well. Those are details that I can go into if people want to talk about that. Um, we can do rotational grazing systems through the rotational camps. That's not really an option for you guys, but if you've got intensive systems, you can do that. This is more in, in, in relation to those imported animals. Those animals that were previously in Kenya, now they're outside, now they're susceptible to infection. I want to bring them back and I want to make sure that they can bring them back safely and not come here to die from the condition. So these are the measures you will be instituting in that, in that particular breeding program. Okay, so if you're ever involved with that kind of thing. Um, you can obviously keep the vectors completely out by a zero grazing system like they've done in a zoo. A zoo is a zero grazing system. And then with thaleriosis, I've developed um, a tick-derived stabilate for roan specifically, for roan antelopes specifically, uh, for roan, uh, the thaleria that kills them. And it worked very well. We could see, uh, we can, from this type of research, we could determine the, the incubation period of the condition in roan antelope. We can determine whether it's, and, and we also found that it's quite dose dependent as well. The higher the dose, the more lethal the particular thing is. So yeah, that's, that's important things that we can chat about if you want to. In conclusion, essentially, um, so it's ubiquitous amongst animals in the wild. Um, it is uh, dependent on endemic stability, whether you're going to get disease or not. Africa is really endemic stable. You don't have really much, much issues. But when you relocate antelope, that is the problem. Are you going to worry about this? Are you not going to worry about this? It's up to you whether you want to worry about this. Do you worry about endangered species in your, in, your, in your population that can get exposure to a new Thaleria species coming from South Africa, from anywhere in Africa, then you should be worried about this. Okay, if you're not worried about them, then fine. So um, the rest of it is really something I've really covered already in summary, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. Uh, merci, Dr. Daniel. Euh, vous notez les questions, on aura une discussion de 20 minutes à la fin des de quatre présentations. Euh, maintenant, nous invitons le docteur Dan pour les maladies respiratoires chez le mouflon de l'Amérique la, du Nord. So I'm going to talk about uh, something a little bit different. I think we've seen some, had some really interesting case studies over the last day and a half, um, and I was asked to talk about some of the stuff that we're we're working on in in uh, North America. And this is some research that, that I guess I've been working on. I've been working with uh, bighorn sheep, which will be our, our case study example shown here. These are mountain sheep in North America, um, but it's an interesting case study in the sense that it, it's not really so much about um, treatment, but more about understanding the ecology and epidemiology and how we can use that to uh, improve the health, of, health of, a, of a species. So just a little bit back, a, bit, a little bit of background on, on bighorn sheep. They're, they're one of my favorite species, so I like talking about them. Um, they're a really interesting animal. They can inhabit a wide range of habitats. Um, 
from river canyons to foothills to mountains, um, and they, they can range from 450 meters to over 3,300 meters in elevation. So they, they can operate or live in, in, in a wide, wide range of elevations. But one of the, the common aspects of, of the uh, places that they live is that there usually has to be steep, rocky areas. And this is what they use to escape from predators, but also to have their young. And so it's a protected place, where, and, and they, they, they're amazing at being able to negotiate and navigate the, the, these rocky regions. And some of the most productive bighorn sheep habitat is actually these high elevation alpine meadows. Um, and the reason why they like them is that the forage quality is high and, and it's really good forage for, for much of the year. And that's where we get into kind of the, the problems that we run into with, with domestic sheep. So this is really a story about, about two different sheep species, wild, wild sheep and domestic sheep. So just so, so, some um, photos uh, of places um, where I've worked. This is, these are herds in Colorado, a state in the US, United States. Um, these are a couple of rams during the rut. They really like to butt heads. Um, this is us doing some capture work. I-70, a major highway running east and west for the United States is, is below us. And you can see kind of how steep and rocky some of these areas are. Um, you can see sheep up here in the uh, on the edges here, we're, we're trying to do some darting work. And these are some of the high elevation alpine areas they like to ha inhabit. You can see the rich green mush forage that, that they're, they're feeding on um, and some of the rocky habitats that they like to, to, to lamb in. So to, to under, understand why, why we're working on this species, you need to know a little bit about the history. So, Pre-European settlement, um, there's various estimates, but anywhere from a half a million to four million animals were believed to be roaming Western North America. But by the 1960s, um, the numbers had declined significantly to, to around 15 to 20,000. So this is a huge decline. And, and these declines were attributed to a whole host of different, different at, uh, factors, including overhunting, um, diseases, which will be our focus today, um, competition with non-native species, and, and different anthropogenic factors. Um, like fire suppression, for example. But you know, it, we've made some, some, some success, had some success in recovering the species. So currently, we estimate there's a little under 200,000 sheep across Western North America. Um, but the problem is the, these populations are small and they're fragmented. They're not interconnected like they used to be. Um, and most of the, the increases that we've seen has been due to regulating harvest, a little bit of habitat management, but really a lot of these various vigorous or very vigorous. Um, translocation programs. We've, had, we've, we've moved over 1,400 um, different herds of sheep around, around Western North America trying to increase their numbers. So, so I'd say translocation is a huge management tool for, for us for bighorn sheep. So here's just a quick distribution map to show how things have changed through time. So in 1850, you can see we had large connected populations across Western North America. And then by the 1960s, there was just a few strong held, a few, few strong populations left. And then in the mid-2000, 2012, when the last survey was kind of done, um, last, last time the data was collected range-wide, you can see that you know, we've, got, we've got more red on the map, but they're in these small, small populations. And this, is, and this is where we start to see some of the problems. So these, these purple, these here, these, this is the bighorn sheep herd ranges, and, and this is in just the western United States. And these colors are different land public lands managed by different agencies. And, and as part of the public land mandate, they allow domestic sheep grazing. And so you can see that bighorn sheep and domestic sheep overlap considerably across their range. And so this is where we get to, to the disease aspect. Um, so there, there's a large number of diseases that affect wildlife, as, and, and this is true for bighorn sheep as well. Um, we have epizootic hemorrhagic disease, sarcoptic mange, but by and, far, by and large, the most impactful, the most meaningful disease is bighorn sheep respiratory disease. And just for an example, um, from some numbers, in, in the mid-2000s, we lost between 1,600 to 1,700 animal, animals in, in just one summer. Um, so that rep represents 1% of the population, and that was all due to respiratory disease. And the symptoms of respiratory disease include nasal discharge, coughing, lethargy, kind of an abnormal stance, drooping ears, head shaking, and inappetence. 
and these the, these epizootics of, of respiratory disease, they can when they happen, they, they, uh, they what happens is what we call an all age die off, where we lose 35 to 95 percent of the, the population across all age classes. So they're significant. But the real sinister thing is that after the die off, we can't recruit lambs. So every year we have lamb epizootics, and so this goes on for decades, and so the population stagnates, and eventually the herds become extinct. And so this is the, 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 the problem that we're, we're being trying to manage. And here's some, some, some uh, gross pathology pictures from the field of, of, of this disease. You can see some lung adhesion, some consolidation. And what's kind of interesting, here's a lamb um, that was found. It's got a little bit of scavenging, but it's in good body condition. So this, this disease is fast, it's acute, it acts very quickly. So, so what is the etiological agent? So this is something that's been evolving through time. When we first started studying it, we thought it was these, uh, these lungworms of the protostrongulus genus. Um, later on, uh, scientists decided, well, no, it's not lungworms, it's actually uh, bacteria in the Pasteuraceae family, particularly Mannheimia hemolytica, Byristania treolosi, and Pasteurella montacida, and particularly the ones that produce leukotoxin, which at attack the white blood cells. But more recently, and, and where our current thinking is, is that it's actually not the Pasteuraceae either, it's these mycoplasma species. So mycoplasma of pneumonia in particular. Um, and what happens is that when it enters the lungs, it inhibits the ciliary action of the respiratory cells, and so it prevents clearance. And so secondary pathogens, such as these Pasteuraceae, come in um, and, and actually cause the, the pneumonia that re results in the, uh, the acute death. Um, and, and the big thing to realize here is this is actually a domestic sheep pathogen. So the role domestic sheep play in this is they, they harbor this pathogen, it's, it's endemic in, in the herds, um, it, it's quite ubiquitous across domestic sheep producers in the United States, and even though it, it doesn't have the impacts we see in bighorn sheep, it, it has economic impacts. It causes weight loss in lambs as well as can create um, uh, non-predator lamb losses as well as adult lamb, uh, sheep losses. So, so it is an issue, but they, they're much more evolved to handle this than the bighorn sheep are. We don't see all-age die-offs in, in these herds, and the diversity of mycoplasma of pneumonia in domestic sheep is quite high. So here's kind of our understanding of the epidemiology of what's going on, and, and even though this is in North America, we can think about this in terms of, of African species as well, that, that it starts with the transboundary interactions between domestic animals and wildlife. So between domestic sheep and bighorn sheep, we have some kind of spillover event. And this, the, because sheep are very gregarious, they're, they're very social, they end up going back, taking the pathogens to the herd, it spreads rapidly through, and we have this epizootic that causes significant population declines. And then as the years progress, we have these persistent infections. We have these individuals that are chronically shedding the pathogen. They give it to their lambs, the lambs, because they like to play together, form these nursery groups, they share their pathogens, and most of them die. And this happens year after year after year until the population goes extinct. So management that we've tried to do, kind of the focus of our, our talks, to th this, this workshop, um, we've tried a lot of things. We, we've tried anti-helminthics when we thought it was lungworms. Um, it wasn't lungworms, so that, that didn't work. Um, we've, we've tried a large suite of different va vaccine strategies, but generally in the past, when we've done most of this, we've been targeting the wrong pathogen. We're targeting a secondary pathogen, and there's no great um, vaccine for mycoplasma of pneumonia. And this is something that's, that's true across wildlife species. It's often very difficult to administer your vaccine as labeled. It's really difficult to get our hands in the, on these animals. You saw the steep terrain we're chasing them through. It's great to get them once, but get them twice, which a lot of vaccines require is almost impossible. We've we, we tried broad spectrum long lasting antibiotics and for, the, for many of the same reasons, very hard to administer, can't administer it as labeled, it's been unsuccessful. And then we've even tried things like mineral supplementation. So um, selenium is believed to be one of those micro elements that um, uh, enhances immune function and based on domestic sheep standards, Bighorn sheep um, tend to be deficient in selenium. So we've tried supplementation and that, that's not been successful either. And then we've, of course, because we like to move sheep around, we've done herd supplementation. So can we just put more animals in? But usually what happens is they die of my mycoplasma or pneumonia, or interestingly, from a social perspective of the sheep, they don't integrate with the herd. Um, and they end up getting eaten by lions and, and other things. 
So, so what do we, what do we do? How, how? So, to be honest, the place where we need to to make the most progress is: can we break the cycle here? Can we prevent these spillover events? That is really challenging, and probably where we're going to continue to focus. But in lieu of that, what else can we do? Is what what, what can we do for these herds that have already been affected? And if you look at this, the epidemiology here, if we can break this cycle here, if we can get rid of these persistently infected individuals, then that will hopefully release the population and we'll see hopefully recruit lambs and it starts to climb. So, so that's what we did. So we did this both with captive and free ranging um, bighorn sheep. And in the captivity, what we did is we set up an experiment where we took um, sheep that we knew were chronically shedding mycoplasma ovum pneumoniae and we mingled those with, with ewes that, that were not and then we looked at lamb survival between ones that were uh, animals that were not shedding that were commingled and animals that were not commingled with shedders. And what we've seen was that there was much higher mortality on lambs for with ewes that were commingled with shedders. So that gave us some hope that all right, maybe maybe our idea idea is going to work. So then we went out into the field and we did an experiment there. And so we had a treatment herd and a control herd. And then the control herd. We had, we had chronic shedders, we had lots of pneumonia, we did nothing. In our treatment herd, we, we serially tested uh, ewes for um, several years, identified the chronic shedders, and then we ended up removing them. And what we saw after we removed them in the years following is that in, even in the adults, we saw higher annual survival rates. Even though it's not statistically significant, we saw a jump in survival of adults, and maybe most importantly, there was no pneumonia in the herd. And then what was really exciting was, was that the lamb survival jumped up, almost doubled, over doubled, from 77 to 35% between the treatment and, and the control herds. And we saw very little mortality in the treatment population versus control population. So this is really exciting because this gives us some, some hope that maybe we can actually clean up these herds and really break the disease cycle. And so I guess the, the whole point of presenting this case study, um, it's, it's North American, it's a different species that, that doesn't occur on this continent. But I think that what, what, we wanted, what I wanted to drive home is that we really started to make progress when we stepped back and really started thinking about the ecology and epidemiology of, of the system and looking for where, where are the weak points in that disease cycle that we can, we can, we can break. And so when we identified that there's these chronic shedders in the population and there's this huge link to how, how the, health, the herd of the health responds over time to the presence of these animals, then once we could remove those, now all of a sudden we start to see progress. And so I thought this was kind of an interesting case study where we didn't apply a vaccine, we didn't apply, uh, apply an antibiotic or any major treatments, it just was really focusing on the epidemiology and understanding that. Now, I'm not gonna say this is, we, we've got it all figure out, figured out. There's, it's still challenging to operationalize. Serial testing of wildlife is not easy, um, but we're working on sheep site tests and, and field tests and those kinds of things to, to make that, that much more uh, easy for managers. But at least provides us for the first time in decades a path to successfully recovering herds. And, and that, for me, that's really exciting because I, I work in a lot of wildlife diseases and there's very few that I can point to, like, hey, we've actually done something positive. So, um, so that's, that's um, my, 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 my case study. I hope you found it interesting. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, merci, Dr. Dan. Nous avons 20 minutes de discussion. Nous allons prendre cinq intervenants. Euh, si le temps nous permet, nous allons continuer également à prendre d'autres intervenants. Cinq intervenants. Voilà. Euh, la parole à qui veut la prendre. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, what I wanted to ask is on the presentation on thylosis. So I'll tell you, um, five years ago, we had a big thylosis outbreak in our cattle population. We've lost probably close to our 500,000 cattle. Excuse me, can I just, can I just interf interfere just a second? Yesterday we had a discussion about how we manage the discussions. So would it be a good idea if we focus on each of the presentations rather than switching from one presentation to the other? So if the first question is on teleriosis, 
I would invite other questions on Telerioses. We close that chapter, we move to the next presentation. Is that, is that okay? Voulez-vous que je traduise? Hier, on a sauté d'une maladie à l'autre par rapport aux, aux questions. Donc, je proposerais de regrouper les questions par rapport à la Telerioses, ensuite les questions par rapport à la pres première présentation et ensuite euh, à la dernière présentation. Si ça ne vous, si vous gêne pas. Je pense que ça va faire le, la discussion un peu plus logique. Donc, euh, nous allons prendre des questions sur la téléryose. Qui veut intervenir sur la téléryose La téléryose. Et... Congo, RTC, Zimbabwe, c'est la téléryose yes. Ok. Madagascar, 3. On finit avec le 3. Attendez. On finit avec le 3. Et Zimbabwe, vous avez la parole. Uh, all right. So my, my, my question was on, or probably would be on, um, on the treatment regime. So what we noticed is people tried a lot of things because the, what happened is, you know, the cattle were dying and um, it was like widespread. It had never happened in our country before because we had actually upset our dipping kind of regime. And we, we tried Bupa Pavacon it's because it's, it's, um, it's a registered product in, in Zimbabwe. But what people would do, because it's so much of an expensive product, not really expensive, but I mean, if you have probably 100 to 200 kettle, then you'd want to probably stretch that bottle. And people would underdose it. And still the animals would die. So what we then realized is it was sort of like dose dependent. So if you give the first dose and you don't give the second dose at, um, at a good enough uh, dosage rate that was stipulated on the bottle, you know, it wouldn't make even an effect. And what people started doing is you would use Bupa Pavacon and you'd give it 48 hours later, but then you'd also use, um, you know, drugs like um, oxytocycline plus dexamethasone. Then you'll probably get a full recovery. And it was interesting to note to say, look, Bupa Pavacon alone, even if given at the optimum doses, at the right doses, still the animals would die. You know, they would start having blindness, you know, uh, lacrimation, and the next thing, they would die within even 48 hours. So it's, 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 it's interesting to note that you mentioned bupacavacone as an alternative treatment. We never tried doxycycline because it's never available. But what we used is we used oxytetracycline. Um, and it gave, what I would say, um, a sustained response. So you, what you'd have is within a head of, let's say, 10 animals, if one animal comes down, then you'd give um, a prophylactic dose of oxytetracycline to the whole head. You'd probably more or less delay you know, the onset of infection on the other animals. And it was really an interesting um, you know, aspect to note. But what I noticed also is um, on the wildlife species, we had um, animals like sable and buffalo. You know, if you would really transport them to areas where they were never exposed to, you know, sort of like diagnosis uh, endemic areas, the older animals would die. The younger animals would probably fall sick, but then they would sort of like survive, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the older animals. Not so sure if it was age-related, but what we noticed is older animals, eventually it was a given, even for sable, they would all die. Then the young animals, then you know, younger population would then survive and you know, perpetuate. And um, this aspect of dipping in wild populations is actually a very difficult thing because, you know, uh, you know, for for large populations, you'd find them with a lot of ticks, especially sable, um, unless if you feed them, you know, where they come to areas where we would put a bit of deadline and stuff. They are very very. Zimbabwe, resume your question. Le temps. Okay. All right. Resume your question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Merci, RD Congo. Euh, merci beaucoup. Euh, la RDC importe beaucoup d'antilopes de, ces, ces dernières années. Et je voudrais savoir, euh, pendant, pour prévenir la téléryose lors de la translocation ou d'importation, euh, euh, ces animaux viennent souvent avec des tiques sur leur corps. Alors, il y a souvent des discussions de savoir, faut-il euh, désinfecter contre ces tiques, donc les, les nettoyer, tout ça. Est-ce qu'il faut-il le faire ou pas 
et puis aussi euh, la lutte contre l'éthique dans euh, nos, nos parcs animaliers. Euh, on a eu vraiment des difficultés. Je ne sais pas s'il y a des techniques pour réduire un peu l'impact d'éthique sur euh, les antilopes. Et puis également, euh, nous avons con con constaté qu'entre les gnous noirs et les gnous bleus, apparemment, les gnous euh, euh, noirs ne résistaient pas aux tiques. Ils mouraient. Je ne sais pas si la télériose pourra, pourrait être... À la, à la base de cela. Et ces, ces, ces antilopes venaient beaucoup plus de l'Afrique australe, l'Afrique du Sud, Namibie, Zimbabwe et Zambie. Merci. Madagascar. Euh, merci. Euh, ma question, c'est... Euh par rapport au, à ce que la RDC vient de noter tout à l'heure par rapport au TIC, euh, j'aimerais rebondir par rapport au contrôle. Il est évident que les, les TIC jouent un rôle important dans, dans, dans la transmission et la propagation de, de la téléryose. Ma question concerne, le, euh, selon votre expérience, quelle serait la méthode la plus adéquate utilisée euh, en fin de sauvage et euh, la deuxième question, euh, est-ce que la lutte antivectorielle sur l'animal lui-même en faune sauvage est possible et est-ce euh, efficace Merci. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres interventions sur la téléryose Nous allons prendre deux personnes encore. Oui. Ghana. Yeah, et... um... Thank you, Dr. Steele, for your nice presentation. Um, I did some work on Teleria Pava in this very region of Arusha, though I'm from Ghana. Um, during your presentation, I guess uh, my heart started pumping faster um, because uh, Ghana is beginning to have a lot of private uh, ranches and we are importing a lot of sables and runes from South Africa. And just like you said, PCR, negative, and then we are beginning to have some mortalities, some of these animals, so I'm, I'm a bit worried. The colleague from Zimbabwe was about talking about <coughs> dipping wildlife species, and he was stopped. I was interested to, 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 to hear him share some, some experience. But anyway, I'm not asking a question. After this, I'll have more discussions with the presenter and the colleague from Zimbabwe and other colleagues so that we share experience so that Ghana doesn't, uh, because West Africa, Telera power doesn't exist in West Africa. So we don't want it to become an issue there. Thank you. Nous allons donner la parole au Dr. Johad pour répondre aux questions. Merci. Okay, thank, thank you, Chi. Um, There's the first question from, from Zimbabwe. There's a couple of, couple of issues. Um, so there was lots of cattle dying at one stage, and the question was what may have happened there, and they suspect that the dipping regime or dipping policy may have changed and may have affected that. It's certainly, certainly so. I think it's very important to, to bring a concept across about why animals get the disease form of it and it's a density-related disease. Like many diseases are a density-related disease. COVID is a density-related disease. I mean, um, human population is too high and we, that is why we get problems. So it's about density of animals. And you know, what do you do? You cannot really reduce now cattle numbers, that's not an option. So you need to then artificially control, to control matters and that's where the dipping um, policies comes in and why it works take it away or modify it um, or you get resistance against some of the dips and you get problems. So that's the simple, simple facts about um, this particular condition and, and the effect of dipping. Um, the, the concern about the bipabaquin um, raises a number of issues because um, it is one of our heavy artillery um, chemicals available against this condition. Using it at suboptimal doses is bound to create resistance 
um, in the Taleria Parva population, and then you can get a situation where it looks like um, the bipavoquin treatment is not working anymore, but it's because your Taleria Parva population has become resistant against this chemical. So um, that is a concerning issue, and it may also be a driving force in why the animals are dying and why they're not responding to treatment, okay? The, the routine treatment. It may be then possible in cases where the oxytetracycline was seemingly working um, that the, the population of Taleria parva species was then a bit more reverted back to susceptibility to oxytetracycline. So Taleria parva, and as any organism, uh, will develop resistance against the chemicals they're exposed to. It's all about sex. It's all about genetics. It's all about genetic recombination. The ones that survive are the ones that's going to transfer their genetics to the next population. So oxytetracycline has been used and is still used widely throughout Africa, throughout um, countries. Um, so Taleria parva actually developed resistance against that. And when people are not using it anymore, then the population of Taleria is going to become susceptible to it again. So it's a, it's a very pliable, pliable situation. With regards to the older animals, uh, when buffalo and sable are relocated, there are many, many other conditions that will um, affect um, these, um, these particular species when you relocate them. So you cannot just say it's Tyleria. But what I said to you when you saw my, that picture about the pre-immunity condition, and it's exactly the point I wanted to bring across. If you take an animal that's an adult, from an area where it is used to a specific Tyleria or Babesia or Anaplasma species or strain, and you take it to another area where there's a different strain and there's no cross immunity between these strains, you stand the, the chance of those older animals, because they are past the pre immune stage, to become clinically sick and clinically ill. Okay? The younger animals, they actually have a pre-immunity. I, I, I urge you to read up a bit about pre-immunity and the importance about that concept, that where young animals actually do not develop disease but resistance against <coughs> hemoprotozoal diseases. So read up maybe a bit about that because it's a very important tool in how you manage these um, hemoprotozoal diseases on, on cattle farms and sheep farms. Then onto the DRC, um, it's about the importation of antelope. Um, and let me just see yeah, how, you know, lots of ticks on animals, how, how to prevent, um, you know, high tick numbers in, in antelope species. So um, ticks, you need to understand their ecology as well. Why do they become high in numbers? Again, so suppressing the immunity themselves. So this becomes a snowballing problem for the animals in the system. And therefore, they just get more and more um, um, on the animal, and that's why they eventually succumb to its effects. Whether it's the secondary infections from the hemoprotozoal parasite, whether it is tick toxicosis that kills them, which is, whether it is exsanguination from um, the animals being bled <laughs> dry from, from blood from the ticks, those are the, the, the principles why, and how these things relate to each other. Okay, so um, what do you do? Um, it's, it's about making sure that those animals, when they are coming to the new environment, have some form of adaption period, making sure that they are in very good nutritional condition. Uh, in a stressful time, they don't eat well, and if they don't eat well, the stress is going to cause more ticks and it becomes a snowballing effect. So they need to be in a very, in the optimal nutritional state. Never relocate wild animals at the end of your dry season. That is when the animals will be in their worst nutritional state. Taking them now to the next uh, area where they're exposed to new diseases, new, they will not have the equipment. They will not have the immunological equipment to survive that translocation. So you must move them in the beginning and make, it, make sure you're moving to an, into a situation where they are going to get the proper nutrition. And you can support them, obviously, on that trip by making sure that they get a, an optimal start by treating them with acaricides. Make sure they don't get there with ticks. You don't want the ticks to drop off there anyway because those ticks are likely to transmit 
or it's likely to carry a novel Taleria species, a novel an Anaplasma or Babesia species. You don't want that. And then before the importation should happen, ideally you should actually have done a risk assessment of the area where they are going to. Okay, that is very, very important. If you know that the Taleria or Babesia or Anaplasma species in your country is the same as the Taleria or Babesia species with the, of the originating country, then the importation can happen. Why not? But if you don't have that species, and then you want, you want those species of, of, of antelopes to come to your country, you need to test them for those particular Taleria. Otherwise, you will introduce, you stand the risk of introducing something into that country. And the opposite applies as well. You can bring an animal to a country where they're not used to that, and that's when they die of Taleriosis. Case in point, the... Um, bongo importation that happened an, a number of years ago. Big, big, big issues about it. Animals dying from tyleriosis because they were imported from the United States where they were in a zoo. They never had been exposed to ticks, never had the infection. Then you expose them to this uh, condition for the first time. They are adults. They are out of the pre-immunity stage. So they have the genetic equipment to cope with it as a young animal, but not as an adult. Okay, so that's the key thing. And you need to do those risk assessments properly before those importations happen. Don't worry about Taleria parva in antelope species other than buffalo. Please. Okay? There's no indication that you test a daker, a roan antelope, a toby, a springbok, whatever, for Taleria parva. There's no indication. They don't carry it. Okay? We know that, know that it doesn't happen. So I think I've covered the tea control issue and, and what you must do. It's very important that you you control the ticks. You don't want to introduce a new species of ticks either into an area where they don't belong. Um, that is uh, another uh, uh, key thing. Um, there's this situation about the PCR negative animals that then uh, came from um, the South Africa uh, into, into West Africa and then they started to, to die. Okay, so, uh, you know, PCRs, um, You've got to understand the test well to know how to interpret that. One PCR, especially if people are clever about pupavacuin, remember, that is a very important concept. People can make animals falsely negative by using pupavacuin on them, illegally, in our country. Okay? And then you're going to suppress it, you get a negative animal, it gets there and you get problems. Okay? But the fact that they come to you to die is probably not a bad sign because it means they got exposed to a pathogen that they were not used to anyway. Um, so, yeah, we can discuss that maybe a bit further in, in detail when we are together. Thank you, Chairman. Merci, Doctor. Il nous reste juste deux minutes pour la, la pause café. Ici, on peut prendre un intervenant sur les maladies respiratoires. Maladie respiratoire. Try and identify genetically resistant individuals in the population. Those individuals are then selected, especially the males, because the males have the biggest impact on the whole population in the fastest period of time. So we have actually found that Selecting a genetically, obviously you need to have the means to identify that, that animal, okay? But selecting that animal will have, within one generation, a significant impact on the mortality rate in the animals following the calf crop after in that season. So in Taleriosis, we are now selecting bulls from populations where we know they are resist, where, the, where we know the disease occurs, and we know that they have survived. Mother Nature has taken care of the natural selection process. We take those bull animals and we put them into the population that's susceptible. And within one generation, we've got almost a 9900% um, improvement in calf, calf survival. So genetic testing, we're not there yet. So we're doing this anecdotally. But genetic testing is the new method I think we must go. It's all about sex. It's all about genetics again. It's finding that gene and maybe go and look for it in the sheep because the sheep are resistant to it to mycoplasma, at least most of them. So find the gene maybe in the sheep and then try and see if you've got a match in some population in the, in the in animals and then bringing that genetics in there. Because that's what we do with the Taleriosis. So we are 
trying to use the genetics to modify. We use genetic modification in our vaccines to vaccinate ourselves against this COVID virus. This is the new thing. We must use genetics to, to make our selection of resistant animals um, possible. Merci, Dr. Nous sommes à la fin de notre session. Et je crois que vous avez noté des questions. Il faut s'adresser pendant la pause café aux différents présentateurs. Et nous allons observer la pause café et nous allons reprendre à... Nous allons reprendre à 11h00. Un applaudissement pour les quatre présentateurs. Merci.
Et nous allons reprendre les travaux. J'espère que tout le monde a pris la pause café. Et nous avons une dernière présentation qui va durer une heure du temps. Et c'est la bonne pratique à gestion de maladies et la lutte contre les maladies de la faune sauvage. Euh, docteur Léane, vous avez la parole. attempt to talk slowly. <laughs> My apologies ahead of time to the translators. All right, so yesterday we talked about um, best practices for uh, disease management and wildlife populations. And, and pretty much everything I talked about yesterday was covered in the disease manual. Um, but when Dan and I worked on the disease manual, um, it was back in 2019. And since then, um, we have, I wouldn't say discovered, but we've come across these new, new approaches called systems thinking um, that we have started applying to some of the wildlife health issues in the United States. And they really came about out of a frustration of, of many of the traditional approaches that we've been using for wildlife disease, not having the impact that we, that we wanted, or we would start making progress on a wildlife disease and then run into some additional impediment. And we went in search of, of new approaches for those diseases. So, to help us understand what systems thinking is, I'm going to start with a parable. Um, some of you might have heard of this parable before, and I'm just applying it to systems thinking. So in ancient times, a king ordered all of his blind subjects to, to be assembled and then divided into groups. And the groups were then taken to an elephant, and each group was asked um, to identify what they thought, what they, thought they were encountering. So the, the group of men that were touching the trunk of the elephant said, ah, I think this is a snake. The group of men that were touching the leg of the elephant said, I think this is a tree trunk. The group of men that were touching the tail of the elephant thought it was a rope, whereas the men touching the, the body of the elephant, encountering the hair of the elephant, said, I think this is a brush. And that poor guy over on the right, well, he just sort of got the, the short end of the stick. So the story goes that they argued amongst themselves and each insisted their version was correct and that the other was wrong. And it was only when they listened to each other and built on each other's perspectives that they were able to construct the whole picture and really quote unquote see the elephant. So the moral of the story is that when we fixate on the parts of a system, we each gain a partial understanding but really misunderstanding the whole. And certainly the parts don't explain the behavior of an elephant. So it's only when you can see the total system that an elephant really becomes an elephant. So what is a system? Well, a system is a set of interacting components that are organized in a way that achieves something. So systems sort of take on a life of their own. They have a behavior due to the interactions of all of, all of the factors. And, sim and systems can be simple. And for simple systems, there's clear cause and effect. So A does something, B does something, together they cause C to do something, and then that results in an end product of D. And simple systems create simple problems. So your phone battery dies, your car runs out of gas, you burn your cake, you know what to do, right? You know what caused it, you know how to fix it. And for simple problems, I would say that reductionist techniques work well for problem solving. So reductionist techniques are when you try to break a problem down into its simpler components, figure out what the problem is, and fix it, right? So this is the way you approach car mechanics, for, for example, or at least car mechanics before they involved computers. But systems can also be complex. And so for complex 
complex systems, as we mentioned on, on the previous slide, systems are these interacting interactions of components that are achieving some sort of purpose. And the interactions among these components are what makes them stable, right? So for natural selection or genetic diversity, when left untouched by humans, does its thing, it's a stable process. But because of the stability within complex systems, you can also create intractable or stubborn problems, these problems that despite your best efforts, you can't seem to, to solve them. So some examples of, of complex problems created by complex systems are things like poverty or global food supply, loss of biodiversity, and wildlife trade. See, I know I'm talking fast again. I'm going to try to slow down again. So wildlife trade. Um, and, and it's because of all of the interactions of things like, so if you think about poverty or global food supply or loss of biodiversity, it's really the interactions of, of not only the environment, but it's the environment with the political structures, with the economy. So it's all of those things operating in concert together that are making the complexity. And systems thinking is a way of thinking about these complex problems that can really help us understand more deeply how complex systems operate. It can help us address how the parts are connected and not just think about the parts as individual pieces. It can help us recognize hidden and unintended consequences. It can help us push behavioral change. And it can help us look for small changes that can have really big impact. Okay, so how is systems thinking different than our conventional thinking? So I've sort of described in general what the process is. And conventional thinking is how we're taught to think in schools. So as scientists, we're all taught to divide the world into specific disciplines, and we all sort of stay in our, in our lanes, and we have these silos that we all talk about. And then we divide our problems into their components, and we try to optimize, optimize our, individual, our individual components um, to, to optimize the whole. And this type of thinking, as I mentioned, certainly still has a role in problem solving. So if I cut my hand, I need a Band-Aid. Going back to the car example, if my car runs out of gas, I need to put gas in it. You don't need to give a lot of thought to those things. But conventional thinking isn't suited to address complex problems like I mentioned on the previous slide. It's not really suited to address things like poverty and loss of biodiversity. So this is a table that I think is kind of helpful. It came from this really incredible book that if, you're, if you get interested in this and you're, you're, you want to learn more about it, I would highly recommend this book. It's called Systems Thinking for Social Change. And this is one of the tables from the book. And conventional thinking says, OK, the connection between problems and their causes are obvious, pretty easy to trace. But with systems thinking, you, say, you, you start to think about, well, the relationship between problems and their causes is maybe more indirect than I thought and not quite as obvious as I thought. In conventional thinking, we often find ourselves thinking, oh, it's, it's the other agency. If they would just do x, y, and z, uh, whether it's with their outside our organization, they're really the ones to blame for our problems. They need to be the ones to change. If they would just change, then this problem could be solved. But with systems thinking, we start to realize that we, whether it's our organization or us as humans, have really, we've all unwittingly created our own problems and have significant control or influence in solving them through changing our behavior. Conventional thinking says, okay, well, a policy designed to achieve short-term success will also assure our long-term success. With systems thinking, we really start to realize that these short-term fixes have unintended consequences. And I'm going to talk a lot about that in the later slides. This has happened time and time again in biological systems when we've tried to apply a quick fix. And so we start to realize that quick fixes either make no difference or they end up making matters worse in the long run. Works for now, causes some, some problem later that actually makes the problem worse. And hopefully, um, I'll be able to convince you that with systems thinking, if you, can in, if you want to optimize the whole, we have to improve the relationship among the parts and not just optimize the individual pieces of the system. So if we took a problem like poverty or loss of biodiversity or wildlife trade, I think many of us could start to agree, and eh, the causes between what's causing this probably is not super direct and maybe not even obvious, at least not all of the parts. And if we took a hard look at ourselves, we could probably also say, ah, my agency or me or us as humans have probably, have probably contributed to these problems. And as I mentioned and we talked about yesterday, there are lots of examples of unintended consequences. And then in order to optimize the whole, 
hopefully by the end of this, I'll convince you that, that we need to start optimizing the parts. All right, so now that we've talked about what systems thinking is, when do you apply it? What does a wicked or an intractable problem look like? What are its characteristics? So a wicked problem is, is a problem that's usually seen as chronic, and it's defied people's best intentions to solve it, right? So does anybody in this room know the solution to po global poverty or the solution to loss of biodiversity? Wicked problems usually have multiple perspectives on why we have the problem and what should be done. So I bet you if I went around the room and asked you all to give me the cause of loss of biodiversity, you'd all have different perspectives, and in your own way, you'd all be right. Wicked problems also typically have diverse stakeholders that are having a hard time aligning their effort and tensions, right? So how many of you work with other NGOs or other agencies in your country, and, and, and you all sort of have the same goal or the same mission, but you're just having a hard time collaborating and working towards achieving that goal together. Wicked problems also typically have people who are working on a large number to lead to, to decreases in fish populations. I just have a feeling they're going to if we don't do something about it first. Okay, so the first tool I'm going to talk about is what's called the iceberg model. And the reason why we're starting with this tool is that it doesn't require a lot of mathematical modeling. Um, but can still be a really powerful tool. This is also the tool that Dan and I are gonna use. Am I talking too fast again? Should I slow down more? A little bit, okay. I'm trying, I'm trying really hard. So, so the tool that we'll be using during the tabletop exercise tomorrow, because it doesn't require a, a really deep understanding of systems theory, but can still be used to find leverage points um, that can change the behavior of the system. So similar to an actual iceberg, the way this works is that you have an event. An event is sort of how we experience the world. They're, they're the things that are happening, the things that, um, that you react to in your everyday life. But underneath the event, what you often find is the reason why you even think it's a problem to begin with is there's been some sort of pattern of behavior, this sort of feeling of like, oh no, not again, right? It's like my inclination that like, if the real estate grows and the tourism grows on the, on the coast of Long Island, then it's probably gonna end up impacting fish populations if I don't do something, right? Underneath the patterns of behavior, you have what are called system structures. And this is really where you get into that idea of like how the components, how the parts are related, not just the parts themselves, but how do they interact with one another? What causes this to increase or this to decrease? And underneath that, you have mental models. And this is the most important part of, a, of systems thinking, because what you'll end up finding is we humans, the way we think, the things we value, the things we believe, are really what's shaping the world around us. And so by changing mental models, you potentially have the ability to change this entire structure. And so another thing to think about is that as you go down, so I've kind of alluded to this already, is that as you go down the iceberg, you increase your leverage but there becomes sort of a trade-off, right? So changing, um, if anybody has ever worked on just trying to change the culture of their organization, you'll agree with me that this is not easy. Sounds great in theory, but super hard. But, um, you know, there are still things you can do to change the patterns of behavior. There's things you can do to change the system structure, and those can also have leverage. It just sort of depends on, you know, there has to be an assessment of cost benefit of how much time you, you spend. So increasing leverage, but trying to do some sort of cost benefit, which we'll talk about tomorrow. So I decided to go with a really, um, and so maybe the IT people in the back want to like close their ears. So I, I, I came up with an IT example for you all, because I didn't want us to all argue about my example. I wanted to just show you an example. So we're going to go through an, I, an IT example or an information technology example for, um, for how an iceberg model could work. So let's say you are the manager of an IT team and you're getting ready to release some sort of IT feature. And the event is that there's some unexpected bug or problem in the IT feature. And so you could initially say, ah, go back and fix that bug. But if you thought about it and you realized, oh my gosh, there have been unexpected errors the last three or four times a feature has been released by my team, that would be a pattern, right? Think about that a little more, of like, well, what's causing that, 
right? And so you, you ask around and you realize, oh my gosh, my team doesn't actually have a plan for testing. They don't actually do the quality assurance testing until the feature is ready to be released. And then they also say, well, it's not really our fault. We have these crazy tight deadlines to get, to get the, the feature released. And if you dig a little deeper, you might realize after talking to your team that they're valuing shipping, getting, getting the product shipped on time over the quality of their work. And if you dig a little deeper between, b below that, you might find that your teams don't believe they should push back on manager deadlines. So it's not that your team wants to push out an, a, product with an, a product with a problem, but really they're feeling this sort of internal pressure, maybe it's spoken, maybe it's unspoken, that they don't have any ability to push back on those deadlines, so they're just trying to meet the deadline. Okay, so that's the iceberg model. And that can all be just done qualitatively, descriptively, just thinking deeper about, it's just a way of breaking down a problem into new component parts. But I've also mentioned previously that a major difference for systems thinking is that it recognizes the existence of these circular causality, right? That A doesn't always lead to B. Sometimes A leads to B and then leads back to more of A. So feedback loops are a way to visualize the relationships among variables. They can help you find delays in the system, which I'm gonna talk about on the next slide, and they can help you understand system behavior and unintended consequences. So I love this example just because it's, it's so, like, we've all heard of this analogy, and so it's just kind of easy to think about. So a feedback loop can be as simple as this. Chickens make eggs, more eggs make chickens. But the more chickens that cross the road, the less chickens you have, right? And so you could imagine a world in which, like, if too many chickens were crossing the road, you end up with no chickens. Or you can imagine a world where like, well, maybe they figured out a way to increase their productivity. That's something humans would ask them to do to sort of counter this road crossing scenario, right? Or maybe there's a scenario in which they balance each other. So feedback loops create causality or the behavior of the system. So I'm gonna keep going back to like systems have a purpose or a behavior because the behavior can be something you want it to do or something you don't want it to do. And there are two basic types of causal loops, balancing loops and reinforcing loops. Balancing loops, despite the name, actually create negative feedback, which I'll explain in a minute. And so because of this negative feedback, they typically, or sometimes, if you're lucky, can create self-corrective processes in a system. They can also be what helps the system self-regulate and they are constantly seeking stability, right? And so maybe if you think about that chicken scenario and before, like maybe the chickens slow down their, they could slow down their rate of egg production if the rate of crossing the road stopped, right? So they're, they're seeking stability. They help you maintain a condition or a state within the system. And, but the bad thing about them is they can be a primary source of resistance to change, right? So that's what makes the, the problem feel intractable. Sometimes you have this balancing loop that's seeking stability, but it's causing the problem, causing when you try to change something about the problem, it just doesn't seem to budge. So an example of a balancing loop, again, I try to use really simple examples here, is that it's the way a thermostat works, right? So the temperature goes down or up in a room, let's say it goes down, there's a, the thermostat senses a gap, and then the heat kicks on, the temperature stabilizes, until which point it goes down again, thermostat keeps on again, right? So like, it's a balancing loop. It's keeping, it's the, the thermostat is the mechanism that's keeping this at a stable, at a stable temperature. Systems can also have reinforcing processes. And this is, this is positive feedback. And so despite the name, positive feedback isn't always a positive thing. It just says it's in increasing something. They can create vicious or virtuous cycles that generate growth. Sometimes reinforcing processes can be really good. And they can also create vicious cycles that grow a problem. So an example of a reinforcing feedback loop um, here is population growth, right? So more births per year, increases your population, you have more people, you get more births per year, right? And so on and on it goes, and that's what creates exponential growth. System, um, system feedback loops also create delays in a system. And delays occur because it takes time to recognize, measure, or assess the current state or status of a system. It takes time to decide which actions to take. It takes time to implement those actions or make corrections. And it takes time to, to alter or impact the current state or status with an action. 
So one of the most well-known ways to discuss system delays can be demonstrated by looking at um, inventories of supplies, of inventories and supply chains. And I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but um, system syncing has been used for many public health issues, and I'll even discuss some where it's been used for, for wildlife conservation issues, but the primary literature comes out of, bus of the business literature. And so there was this really interesting simulation game that was developed out of MIT, which is, which is the Massachusetts in Institute for Technology, and they're really the leaders in the United States for, for systems thinking methods and applications. So this beer distribution game was developed, um, I, I don't even know, it probably 20 to 30 years ago out of MIT. And basically it says, okay, so you start with, you start your retailer and you start with um, outgoing orders. So your customers are really enjoying a particular type of beer that you carry and so you're really selling it quickly. And so in an ideal scenario, you have outgoing orders, you put in your, um, you put in your order to your supplier, you have beer coming in at the same rate it's going out, and so everything's happy. Everything's working the way it should here. But in the game, which you can actually play online, you can download it, because it's a really interesting way to just think about delays in systems and how sometimes they're created by, by things over here, by the fact that people have to decide which actions to take and it takes time to do that. So what actually happens in reality is that you have outgoing orders and you put in your, you put in your order to the supplier, but there's a delay. And I'm going to get into why there's a delay in the future. So this is actually hidden from you in the game. So you put in your order, and you're trying to win the game, right? You want to have like beer coming in and going out at the same rate. That's sort of the, the purpose of the game, and that would be the purpose if you were an actual retailer. But you get an anxious. You're like, well, oh my gosh, I've put in an order for beer. It hasn't come in. Something must be happening. You get sort of that, that anxious feeling of like, well, maybe, maybe they either didn't receive the order or I'm going to have more orders before I even get the order. So that sort of human anxiety comes in. The beer's not received, so you increase your back order. And then finally, when the beer does come in, the supplier catches up with demand. Finally, when the beer comes in, you have an enormous amount of, of backlog of beer, right? This just kind of makes intuitive sense. Oh, this is how this happens, right? And this happens all the time in the supply chain. There's a bunch of papers. Um, I'll talk about the bullwhip effect in a minute of like what this then does throughout the entire supply chain. And there was a really interesting, I know, it's because I get excited. It's just really hard to talk slow. Okay, I'm gonna try again. You just keep doing that, Baz. Ugh. That's literally how fast my brain works. So I will try again, third time. So, um, okay, so I'll talk in a minute about how this interacts throughout the entire supply chain, but this happened a lot during COVID. And once you know this, you kind of go, oh, how do they keep doing this? But it just happens over and over again because pieces of a system are hidden and there's a delay in the system. And so everybody reacts the same way. Okay, so system delays can create unintended consequences. Um, and this is, I've, I've touched on this on the previous slide, how delays can do this. But just to go through an, uh, just a really easy example here. So you have a problem, you have a fix, you apply the fix to the problem, it fixes the problem. Unless there's a delay in the system, which causes unintended consequences, which causes your problem to get worse. So an example um, of this from sort of the natural world is the use of DDT or any sort of pesticides ends up causing all kinds of unintended consequences. And I'm also going to give you this example from sort of more of a social setting because I, I think this is fascinating to use when I think about how to organize my center and how we do things and create unintended consequences. Am I talking too fast? Unintended consequences at the center. And so you have a conflict. And let's say, let's say I'm a supervisor, right? So I'm a supervisor of multiple teams at my center. There's a conflict going on. I go to those two people and I say, you guys really need to sit down and figure out how to solve this. But everybody's busy and maybe it takes, maybe somebody goes on vacation and it takes a while for them to meet and figure out how they're gonna move forward. And then, so in an ideal world, the conflict starts here. There's an internal effort to resolve it. But now there's this delay, like I mentioned, they've gone on vacation or they're really busy finishing up a research project. And so their collective ability to resolve the conflict, it's coming, but me as a supervisor, I'm like, oh my gosh, they're not doing anything about this. And so clearly they need some help. 
And then if you pile on the idea of like, I'm a supervisor and I've had this one group have conflict and now I've got another group having conflict, I'm just like throwing my hands up and I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys do not know how to solve conflict. Apparently we need an external mediator. But then in this instance, which I've actually seen happen before, so in this instance, an external mediator erodes the confidence in your staff to, to solve their own conflict. They just say, well, I don't need to do this. They're gonna bring somebody else in, so I don't even need to work on it. Then that's gonna increase their dependence on an external intervention, which is gonna decrease their willingness to even confront the conflict to begin with, which is then gonna increase your, your need for internal efforts to resolve the conflict. So starting to see sort of how like a very good intention, I'm trying to help my staff, I'm bringing in an external mediator, all of a sudden now I've got more and more conflict at my center, and I think this might have actually happened at my center, even though I didn't draw this graph. Okay, so I alluded to this before, but this is what's known as the bullwhip, bullwhip effect. And knowing this will make you feel super smart when you read in the newspaper that this happened yet again to something in the global economy. So uh, the bullwhip effect is created by system delays. And so they create what these, it's called a bullwhip because it sort of has the shape of a bullwhip, um, but it's basically just oscillations in the system. And it starts out as a small wave and then the wave gets bigger as it goes on throughout the system. And it's often, as I mentioned before, with the beer game, it's a hidden structure of the system. So the way this works is you have a raw material, but there, everything, in this, everything in this chain is linked to the demand of the previous thing. So raw materials are, in, in an ideal setting, produced at a rate that meets the demand of the manufacturer. The manufacturer manufactures things at a rate that meets the wholesaler's needs. The wholesaler is trying to meet the retailer's needs. And the retailer is trying to meet the customer's needs. So what we end up finding, and this happened, I thought this was interesting because it actually happened with bikes during the pandemic, is that you get a small spike in a customer demand and it creates these giant ripple effects throughout. As the retailer tries to meet the customer's demand, they put in more orders to the wholesaler, who puts in more orders to the manufacturer, who puts in more orders for the raw material maker. And if you have enough, because raw materials are for bikes, for example, are used for more things than just bikes, then you have all of this demand on the raw materials all coming in at the same time, and they can't catch up. Okay, so this takes us on to our, our third, or our second tool, sorry, which is causal loop diagrammings. Um, causal loop diagrams can help us conceptually model dynamic systems, um, help us map out how various variables influence one another. They can be useful for uncovering underlying um, feedback structures, and they may be able, you may be able to use them to identify natural constraints and leverage points in the system. That's really the goal of why you would want to use this. Um, I should take that back. You might want to just understand the system, but typically when I apply them, it's because I'm trying to find some leverage point in the system that, that I can change, that will change the behavior of the system. So they're typically made up of elements. So in this really simple example, we have, um, they're just, the elements are the, the words on here. They're made up of the relationships that are shown by arrows. In most of these, you'll also see that the arrows have a, a direction on them. They'll either be positive or negative. You know, does travel time, increase or decrease this. And then these notations here in the center are showing you the balancing or reinforcing feedback loops. So you can create causal loop diagrams. They can really vary from anything simple like this one here that's demonstrating how increasing freeway capacity that's intended to reduce travel time for city residents actually creates urban sprawl. There's a bunch of papers on this and it's fascinating, right? So. Um, you have a lot of traffic density. All the residents start complaining to their various members of the, their various elected members and they say, oh my gosh, my travel time is way too much because of this travel density. And so travel time then increases your pressure to reduce travel time. These are the politicians and things like that up here, maybe your urban planners that say, we've got to do something about this. So you increase your freeway capacity. But as your freeway capacity increases and people are like, oh, this isn't so bad to make this hour long, what used to be an hour long commute, now it's only taking me 30 minutes. So now I can move out to the, to the suburbs, get a bigger house, and now we've got urban sprawl. And then as this continues to increase, we just increase our traffic density again. So lots and lots of these things in the real world. But it's also been used, so these causal loop diagramming methods have also been used to look at the relationship among drivers in the ivory trade. This was a paper that came out, I'm trying to remember what year it came out, oh, in 2019. 
Um, and they found both negative and, and positive feedback loops, like not surprising, right? And they found that, that the impact of both consumer demand in China and market availability were ultimately what was driving, what was driving um, ivory trade in this instance. And what they found, even though this kind of looks messy and complicated, um, through the systems mapping structure is that a potentially lean solution exists. And so from this um, exercise, the World Wildlife Federation is working with many local partners who are going to try to impact both market availability by driving policy changes to secure bans and strengthen enforcement of bans um, via market monitoring and support of, of uh, government enforcement. And they're also um, going to try and impact consumer demand through ban awareness, uh, behavioral campaigns targeted at different buyer groups, reducing demand for Chinese tourists abroad, from Chinese tourists abroad, um, by partnering with travel and tourism companies uh, to provide information and messages and alternatives to these consumers as they plan to travel. And you can sort of imagine a world in which if they just tried to tackle one or the other, the efforts would likely fail, right? So if they just tried to tackle consumer demand, but there's plenty of market availability, that's not going to work. And if they tried to tack tackle market availability while the consumer demand increases, well, then you just drive more things into the black market. I talk so fast I broke it. It's not working. Maybe? I want credit for trying. This is not the way it works. All right. All right, so let's say we've created one of these causal loop diagrams like this, or maybe like the one in this picture, right? This just looks like a big mess. And maybe if you took the time to like stare at it long enough, you could figure out what to do. But in most cases, you need some sort of a tool that can help you assess the impact of various decisions before you implement them. And every decision, as I'm sure you're all aware, requires some sort of trade-off. Doing this means you can't do that or can't dedicate as much resources to that or maybe even has a different outcome. So that brings us to our third tool, which are management flight simulators. So these are, these are a simulated environment that allow managers to explore consequences of different strategies and learn from their experience. And so you might be familiar with simulation environments when it comes to training pilots or doctors or power plant operators, right? So we don't want any of those people just sort of like trying something and seeing how it goes. So they create simulation environments so they can practice and learn and see how different decisions actually impact the, the outcome. So the same thing applies to management flight simulators for, um, for systems thinking, um, where we, we create them to allow sort of an experience for managers so they, so they can learn from their experience in a more controlled setting. And most have um, a lot of quantitative models behind them um, that, you know, for good reason is not necessarily the skill set of our managers. And so they, they typically um, provide a computer interface that allows non-modelers to more easily interact with, with these complex models. And it allows them to explore the consequences of different strategies um, and, and really see the immediate effects of, and consequences of those decisions that would typically unfold over years or decades. It allow, and, and it allows them to sort of juggle competing priorities, and this has been a really um, important one for the work that Dan and I are, are building one of these for, is, is that we realize that a lot of the conflict is coming around just the, w the different ways people are prioritizing different outcomes or different components of the system. So climate is a good example of, a, of both a complex and a dynamic system. It's driven by multiple feedback processes, time delays, and nonlinearities. And research has shown a really poor understanding of processes, of all of these processes, even among highly educated people with strong technical backgrounds. And our human brains just aren't built to hold all of the pieces of information all together at the same time. Um, another really, uh, another, uh, 
Another factor for a climate change is that policymakers often complained that the climate models were not only difficult to understand, but they couldn't get real-time information of, of how policy A would have impact on, policy, on, on the climate in real time enough for them to make policy decisions. So they needed something that you know, they could use in their policy discussions. So again, um, researchers at MIT uh, helped develop a climate simulator called En-ROADS um, that allows policymakers, and, and, actually, and actually anyone can, uh, can look at this online if you're interested, um, and allowed them, allows policymakers, or if you wanted to look at it, to examine different climate policies of things like a coal tax or a subsidy on re renewables for, and, uh, by just moving these corresponding sliders, and you can instantly see the effect on, on climate. So, so here under, under this heading is, is various energy supply options. So it has like a little, uh, little gray hashtag here, which you can't see, but um, you can see it online. And it shows where status quo is. So, right, so we have heavy reliance <clears throat> globally on coal, heavy reliance on oil, heavy reliance on natural gas, renewables sits here, nuclear sits here, right? And so you can actually move these sliders and in real time see what impact it would have to, to for example, move coal, per, coal use down to here, renewable energy all the way up here, and, and see in real time what impact that would have on the climate. Um, another really interesting um, uh, feature that's available in this, in this model is that they also, you can switch out this graph, so you could see what, and this might be of more interest to, to folks in this room, is that you can see what impact these various uh, energy various energy usage, usages would also have not only on uh, the temperature, but also on sea level rise, greenhouse gas concentration, or ocean acidification. So you just switch out this graph. So those are the three tools, because I didn't want to overwhelm you all, um, that, that, we, that we're going to cover, um, just to give you kind of a taste of what tools are out there for systems thinking. But another really important feature um, that I actually couldn't find this in the literature, but I've just I've, I've pulled it out of all of the reading that I've been doing, is that system thinking also requires a willingness to continually learn. So with systems thinking, it's, it's sort of a change in your mindset where you start to expect to continually adjust policies and practices by learning from the outcome of previously used policies and practices. So even with a, a management flight simulator, there's still, you know, not, not every single, well, no models are exactly right. So you learn from them, you adjust your model, and you're going to have to adjust your policies and practices. Um, and not only is it an adjustment in your mindset, but this is something that you need to talk to your policymakers, your decision makers about, the people in your office about, your colleagues, um, about this willingness to, to do more of like adaptive style management, right? So adaptive management um, is, is not new, but I don't know that everybody sort of thinks in this way of this willingness to like, yes, we're gonna make a decision, and we're going to try to do our best with the information we have, but we're going to have to make adjustments as we go. And this is just really crucial to sort of like drill into our heads for addressing wicked problems. We all want to get it exactly right the first time, but that's just really unlikely to happen. All right, the last thing I'm going to leave you with is what's called, it's this concept known as leverage points. And it feels really abstract, or at least it did to me when I was first learning about it. Um, but it's, it's from a book by Donella Meadows, who's one of the like, leading, she was one of the leading researchers um, for systems thinking. And the book is called Thinking in Systems. And she identified 12 leverage points in a system and put them sort of in order of their ability to have impact on the system. And since we just discussed climate change, I'm going to use that as an example to make this, this idea of a leverage point um, more tangible to you. So this is from a paper called A Leverage Point's Perspective on Sustainability. And what they did was take um, from the literature various things that people had proposed to do for climate change and put them sort of in order, in order along the scale of leverage points from sort of um, things that are maybe easier to do and, uh, but would have less impact all the way to the things that were the hardest to do but would probably have the biggest impact for climate change. So to give you an idea of, of what these look like, she, she breaks them into these groups, which I'll, I'll show by orange headings on each of the slides. And then under that, I have examples of things that are considered parameters. So parameters are over here on the lower end of the leverage point. And those are the constants, parameters, and numbers. 
Um, so if, if you apply this to climate change, this would be like changing the average fuel consumption of a car, right? This was one of the first things we all gravitated to as a society when we started thinking about climate change of like, okay, well, if cars contribute to this, then let's, let's up the average fuel consumption. But as we've seen, that hasn't had a huge impact on climate change. You can also change the size of buffer stocks relative to flows. And this is the amount of total standing. This, an example would be the amount of total standing timber in a forest, in a production forest. So makes a difference, but probably not gonna totally fix the problem. The structure of material um, stocks and flows, um, an example of that is the runoff dynam dynamics of nutrients from agricultural fields into adjacent water bodies. And again, this idea of like the leverage goes up, the way you can also increase your leverage is by combining things, by the combining options. But I'm just trying to give you an idea of like, taken on their own, if this is all you did, doesn't have a big impact. So that's what I mean by it. Okay, so moving up the, the leverage point diagram, um, the next is feedbacks. And um, feedbacks can include the length of delays relative to rate of system change. So this is like the time it takes for the ozone hole to close after harmful emissions cease. The strength of negative feedback loops. So this would include the extent to which a lake could absorb uh, nutrients and thus remain clear. Gains around positive feedback loops. So this is the extent to which poverty leads to population growth, which may further exacerbate poverty. And it's not to say that this wouldn't be incredibly hard. It's just saying that population growth isn't the only thing contributing to, um, isn't, the, isn't, the, isn't the only thing contributing to climate change. I'll show on the next slide that consumer, consumer um, uh, behaviors are actually a bigger driver than just population growth alone. So design of your system, so this is a structure of information flows. So this is I just touched on, is consumer knowledge about where certain products come from. The rules of the system, so this is, you can change your incentives or your constraints. And when I think of incentives and constraints, it's often easier for me to think of, um, of like a social issue, of like what are the incentives that, you know, incentivize researchers to work on something easy versus work on something incredibly difficult and risk taking, right? So there, there are things built into sort of the way our publisher parish model works in academia um, that maybe drive some of those things. So an example of that for, um, for uh, climate change is policies governing natural resources, including, including among, other, um, among others things like taxes and regulations. And then finally, this is the one that's the most difficult to wrap your head around, but it's, it's the power to change system structure or self-organize. So it's sort of this idea of like, well, maybe you can just change the entire paradigm under which the system's operating. And this one is the ability of farmers to organize the sustainable, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. So the power to change system structure or self-organize, an example of that is the ability of farmers to organize the sustainable use of a communal pasture. Again, hard to do, but by itself not gonna fix it. And so then finally you get to the highest leverage point of the system. And so this is what I jumped ahead on before. And this is the goals of the system. So you could imagine a world in which, I don't know how you would do this, but if you could organize um, global institutions to support free trade versus global equity, at changing that, that aspect of it. Um, you could change the paradigm underpinning the system, so you could create a green revolution paradigm underpinning agricultural policies. And finally, this is the one I just alluded to, which is the power to transcend the, power to, the paradigm. And this would be if we could make the entire world um, have a conscious shift from a growth-based economy to a steady state economy, we could really have a huge impact on climate change. So I'm gonna end with this, this one slide because I probably overwhelmed you all both with my fast talking and all of the new concepts. Um, and just let you know that there are a bunch of free online tools for systems thinking and mapping. So iceberg models and causal loop diagramming can be done with a simple um, paper and pencil. Um, like I said, we're gonna work through an iceberg model tomorrow specific to a wildlife uh, disease issue. But there are a lot of on online tools, so once you once you get to the place where you have a bunch of causal loop diagrams, a piece of paper can get kind of messy. And so there are a bunch of tools online that you can use to, to help create them. Um, and I just listed, listed a few of them here um, if you're interested. And these are all free ones, free, free to use. So other than why do I talk so fast, does anyone have any questions? Nous avons we 10 have minutes, few, donc have, uh, si vous like avez des questions, right? posez-les. Nous avons 10 minutes, ok. Je vais me mettre ici, en cas où quelqu'un veut me demander des questions vraiment difficiles. Est-ce que vous 
anybody have any general impressions from systems thinking? Are you completely overwhelmed? Does it kind of make sense? Yes. Don't ask me how to solve climate change. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it won't be. I, I think it's probably more of a comment uh, than thing. Thank you for the for that presentation and 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 that analysis of the systems thinking. Um, my comment, as you're presenting, what came to me is my experience in one health approach, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, what I've seen as we come together, the different stakeholders is in one health approach, is that we have, we do have a problem, and I think it happens in many, it's the same in many countries. The veterinary or animal health side lags behind than the Minister of Health. So in the resources, resources as in government allocation, but also resource mobilization and the like. And we're sort of um, underplaying the problem that is there that should be solved. We're just being pulled by the Minister of Health and trying to adopt their systems which we struggle to implement. I think it's something that needs to be, uh, that needs to be looked at. And even if you look at the capacity and qualifications of people generally in the uh, veterinary side, down there in the filter district and lower levels, we have way, way less qualified people than their counterparts in, in uh, and thing and Minister of Health gets terribly frustrated to work in this One Health setup. At the same time, the veterinary side gets frustrated because it's being pushed to do things that are actually beyond them. So maybe these are the kind of also tools that could be very useful to understand these systems. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely think so. So um, it. It's not exactly the same, but Dan and I have been pushing for changes to One Health in the United States because we feel like um, a lot of the surveillance that we do for, wild, for wild, diseases and wildlife have been primarily geared towards diseases of public health or domestic domestic livestock. And so if we could transform, again, getting all like woo woo on you guys, but like transform the paradigm and get One Health back to its original roots, which says we all rely on biological systems. And if we can impact the drivers of, of, of emerging disease, like that benefits everybody. And, and move away from just the, the, it's sort of like a hierarchy, right? So you've got public health, and they get all the resources and all of the respect, and then you've got domestic animal health, and then they get slightly less than public health, and then you've got wildlife who are like, please pay attention to me. So I, I think we're trying to figure out a way that like, so going back to some of my examples, where those, those organizations operate more in concert together rather than in that hierarchical structure, because the hierarchy doesn't, doesn't work if like the foundation, which is the biological systems, is what's, being, is what's sort of crumbling. So yeah, I think it would totally work. And there are groups out there that can help organizations do systems mapping, because one of the things that I've found is, I think the approach is really cool, and I know how to apply it now to a wildlife disease issue, but when I try to apply it to an organization, I get a little lost. And so, that just like, I don't know if that should go in there, and there's conflict, and this group doesn't get along, and so there are groups that, um, I feel like this is really loud, there are groups that, um, that, that work on that. So. I'd be really interested if somebody wanted to work on it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for a nice presentation. Of course, you were very speedy, uh, but uh, coming from the US, uh, there is nothing you can do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, uh, I think uh, these are the good new tools uh, for best practices in uh, wildlife management. And uh, being new tools, I think, uh, thank you for an eye opener on the tools. And I hope they are in the manual. 
I think we will, ju we will just need time so that we can uh, Okay, so I meant to mention this. They're not in the manual, and that's because I, so Dan and I started working on, we finished the manual in 2019, and then the pandemic happened, and in that time, I was like immensely frustrated with trying to apply the same management techniques. So then I found systems thinking, and then I didn't have, and then the manual was already published. Okay, so. so, yeah, but uh, anyway, all in all, I hope probably la at a later stage, uh, sure. wo where they can send the notes sure. to us so that we can have time to go slowly. Absolutely. Uh, because they are very important tools. And listening to what you have, uh, you have presented, it literally complement what Dan presented, uh, where he emphasized on understanding ecological and epidemiology of the system. Right. Because uh, uh, I know uh, in wildlife management, uh, ecological context or the ecosystem context is very important in choosing your intervention, your intervention strategy. Because we have a case in Serengeti system in Tanzania where all wild dog uh, parks were wiped up in 1992 by rabies and, uh, and uh, CDV. But uh, through system thinking and uh, looking the different parts of the systems, we realized that uh, the source of rabies outbreak in wildlife was the domestic dogs. Right. And uh, the system thinking entailed us because uh, it's easy to have intervention in livestock or intervention in domestic dogs. Uh, and you save a lot of money than trying to look for the wild carnivores. There are so many, even if you have all the money, you will not be in a position to find all of them for vaccination. Absolutely. So the system thinking approach uh, brought us to interventions in domestic dogs by doing a ring vaccination of all domestic dogs in all villages surrounding the Serengeti ecosystem, 62 of them, and vaccinating about 73,000 dogs every year. Wow. And after uh, 10 years, we found uh, wild dogs coming back in the Serengeti oh, wow. system. So I just wanted to showcase that uh, system thinking is an important tool, but they are, many of them now, they are slightly complicated, but if we have time, I think they will help us very much in deciding an intervention strategy and the right. what system or uh, a subsystem to approach, especially right. choosing. Because in many wildlife outbreaks, I think uh, interventions in livestock, because many of them are spillover right. from domestic livestock yeah. to wildlife. And you will save a lot of money by interventing, by doing an intervention in the livestock component to safeguard, to safeguard the wildlife health. Thank you very much. Thank you. You could be my new spokesperson for systems thinking. I'll get you up here to talk about it too. No, that's a, that's a really good example. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I'm hoping that um, tomorrow when we, when we go through the iceberg model, when we split you guys into groups and we give you a wildlife health issue to walk through the iceberg model, it'll solidify some of these concepts to you. So a lot of them hopefully were sort of intuitive, this idea of like feedback loops and things like that. Um, so hopefully when we walk through it, it'll, it'll help solidify that. And I do apologize for not putting them in, in the manual. I just haven't, I didn't have time because it was published. Um, but I thought they were relevant enough that I really wanted to, to bring them to this group. I, I don't, do we have time? We have, it's 11.15. Uh, pour les francophones, uh, CDV, c'est canine distemper, donc c'est la maladie de carré. Hein? Did you have a question? What did you say? No, I was just making sure that the translation of the acronym CDV in French was oh, correctly understood because we had a bit oh, of an issue I have yesterday. One minute. Okay. Are we Any good? Any burning questions? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for this, Myung, for the presentation uh, and for giving us an uh, introduction on the uh, system thinking. I think in, I, I will put the analogy with uh, the wildlife uh, and the one health concept. I think it, it will be the, the, the way of thinking that we have to choose because uh, the, the worst scope of the emerging disease in wildlife is still far reaching. 
and uh, we have to start breeding and descending on some steps uh, because there is uh, minimal surveillance, no comprehensive study yet, and um, this incurred cost, limited resources, and uh, and qualified staff, and uh, also uh, fear of trade sanctions. Uh, so um, um, we are moving uh, to an area of uh, policy conflict uh, between natural safeguarding and uh, what vet services should do uh, once we get uh, an outbreak or uh, epidemics. Um, so we have to try um, to find uh, a new form of collaboration, new stakeholders or players, and uh, start uh, uh, to, to find the best way to cope with this uh, uh, one head issues. So uh, we, today we get uh, two interesting uh, um, examples uh, for, um, from teleriosis and um, for the, the disease and uh, big horn sheep in the USA and this new concept of uh, exposure between the naive hosts and, uh, and uh, chronic shader, uh, shaders, uh, I think that, that gives uh, uh, um, another cost-effective alternative method that, that, that could work. So um, that, that's, I, I think uh, we are in the, in the line with these uh, perspectives. Thank you so much. We need to wind up, eh? Okay. Merci, uh, Dr. Leon, for the presentation of system thinking, uh, which really nous renseigne sur beaucoup de choses. Et je crois que nous, nous aurons le temps de demain discuter dans le groupe. Nous sommes déjà à 12 heures. C'est la pause déjeuner. Et à 13h30, nous allons partir euh, pour la visite du Parc national d'Arusha. 13h30 à la réception, s'il vous plaît. Merci beaucoup. Un round of applause for our president this morning, our chairman. Merci beaucoup. A um, few housekeeping announcements. Um, first of all, you received this evaluation form on your desk this morning, so in the course of the meeting, please fill it out as you go through the different presentations, also the logistics of the meeting. It's very useful feedback for us to have. Um, regarding the, the field visit this afternoon, we have shortened your lunch by half an hour. So we will try to leave at 1 p.m., not 1.30, 1 p.m. Uh, that's in full battle dress appropriate shoes, trousers, t-shirts, hats, caps, whatever you need to survive the wilderness. Um, so uh, Grace will have probably more details for you on what's going to happen this afternoon. Um, in addition to what Bassa said, um, you're welcome for lunch now, and we are leaving at one. The vehicles are at the parking lot down here. You can take any of the vehicles, they are game drive vehicles. Uh, thanks to Dr. Julius, we identified ve good vehicles and you can get into any of them. We have 10 of them and each vehicle will carry about six? Seven. seven. It will carry about seven. So from here straight, let's go for lunch and then you go change and then we go for the game drive at one. The vehicles will leave at one. Now, um, you're all welcome for dinner. There's an email that was sent to each one of you. Uh, the dinner will be at 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. at the Lyons uh, Francais. Um, the vehicles will be ready in the parking, in the parking at 6.30. At 6.30, make sure you're dressed for dinner and we meet at the parking. Now, tomorrow morning, I will avail the departure list because some people will be uh, leaving tomorrow evening. 
I will have a departure list uh, at, the, at the registration desk so you can check your time when the vehicle will be available for you to go to the airport. Now, on, if you need a COVID test to, to go to your country, please give me your name. We'll organize for a doctor to come here and do a COVID test this evening. So please give me your name if you need a COVID test for you to travel back to your country. So you're all welcome for lunch. We have the lunch v uh, vouchers. P uh, please pick one as you go out, the lunch v uh, vouchers.